I bought my land, got the plans, and most importantly, got the money lined up. Now I can begin to build my house. Actually, I don't have a clue how to build a house, so I'm working with GreenPod to hire all the subcontractors to do most of the work. The dirt guy I hired uses a backhoe to dig the hole for my foundation. My house is only 576 square feet, and I don't have any debris to clear or any major hurdles, so it only takes him a few hours. Next, the concrete guy comes in and builds forms for the foundation footer. After the footer concrete dries, he builds forms for the foundation. He uses a concrete pump truck to pour concrete into the forms. At first it seems like overkill for such a small foundation, but it really ends up saving a lot of time and money. Plus, the concrete is fresher and better quality. The excavator returns to backfill the dirt, but before he does, he installs a foundation drain around the footer. This will help keep water away from the foundation. He also digs a dry well, which is nothing more than a five-foot hole filled with crushed rock. The footer pipe will drain into the dry well. Another pipe is added that will carry water from the roof gutter, so this setup should be sufficient to handle my stormwater. The excavator also extends the utility pipes and conduits, so they're next to the foundation and easier to get to. Then he backfills the dirt and covers all the trenches and finishes up by sculpting and smoothing out the dirt around the lot. The Green Pod team arrives to assemble the shell of my house. Before the SIPs, or structural insulated panels, are delivered, the team adds a sill plate. The floor panels will rest on the sill plate and connect to bolts built into the foundation. A beam is also installed in the center of the foundation. The panels arrive. The truck gets as close as possible to the job site, which is what they're calling my house now, to make it easier for the forklift to transfer the panels to the staging area. Then the floor panels are carried from the staging area and positioned and connected. Each panel is custom built, so the workers follow the numbers to make sure they're assembled correctly. Caulking is applied so the finished surfaces will be airtight. Connecting pieces, called splines, are fitted into the groove on the edges of the panels. The splines are then used to align and install adjacent panels and to make sure all the connections have a solid, tight fit. After the outside edge of the floor panels are covered, we can start on the walls. But first, the locations of all the electrical chases that were covered by the boards are marked. This will make the electrician's job a lot easier when he runs cables in the floor and walls. Before the wall panels can go up, the bottom plate must be attached to the floor. Then the bottom edge of each panel can be slid right into place and nailed off. The next panel is attached to the first one with a spline, same as the floor. Even though everything should fit perfectly, every panel is still carefully leveled and measured before they're attached permanently. As with the floor, each panel is numbered so they can be assembled correctly. Wall panels are all different. They can be big, small, contain spaces for windows or doors, run floor to ceiling, run along the floor, or come in from the top. It all depends on the house plan and what's the best use of materials for the most efficient and safe structure. Caulking is added wherever there's a connection. Foam may also be used to make sure everything is as airtight as possible. Cargo straps help squeeze panels together. In many cases, a sledgehammer is required when two panels are having major intimacy issues. It's important the connections are tight so everything fits together perfectly. After the walls are up, we start on the roof. First, the top plate is added around the top of the walls. Also, the roof requires a beam. It fits into slots pre-cut in the wall panels. The roof panels are flown in using a telescopic forklift. Splines are added and cocked, and each panel is nudged into place. Once the roof panels are done, the puzzle piece starts to look more like a house. And there's an inside now that I can walk around in. But even though it's shaped like a house, there's still a lot to do. In order to work on the inside, we need to dry in the house, which means basically weatherproofing it. Felt is added to the roof to drain water away from the sips, which are not designed to handle a lot of water. 
All the exposed SIP edges are covered and windows and doors are installed. Interior work begins with construction of the walls around the bathroom, which will also define the location of the bedroom and kitchen areas, and the ceiling above those areas, which will be the floor of the attic. The traditional stick-built method is used with studs, joists, sheetrock, and no insulation. I'm not concerned about the R value of surfaces inside the house that don't connect to the exterior, so I can save a lot of money doing it this way. While the carpenters are working on the interior, the metal roof is installed. I have a simple shed-style rectangular roof, so the bulk of the work is finished in a couple of hours. The house is designed so most of the plumbing is contained in one wall, so that makes rough-in quick and easy. Pipes are also run through the ceiling for the tankless hot water heater in the attic. Next, the electrician runs wires through the walls and ceiling to all the outlets. He uses the electrical chases to run wires through the SIPs. The bathroom exhaust fan has a timer so it can be used for both bathroom exhaust and air exchange. The house will be so airtight that a simple air exchange system needs to be employed to keep the air fresh inside. Sheetrock is added to all interior surfaces except the ceiling in the living room area. I'm going to go with the exposed surface of the SIPs there. While the drywall guy is working inside, the exterior walls are wrapped with black felt, which acts as a water-resistant barrier. Next, exterior siding is installed over the felt. Hardy fiber cement boards are used. They look great and last a lot longer than wood and most other materials. Panels will be used around the bottom of the house, and hardy planks will be lapped around the top. The painters work on the interior while the siding is being installed. It doesn't take them long because there just isn't that much to paint, and the pale gray paint goes on with only a light second coat. Then inexpensive click-together flooring is installed in every part of the house except the bathroom. It goes together easily in a couple of days. After the siding is finished, the painters start on the exterior. We chose colors that would blend nicely with the environment. Meanwhile, the IKEA kitchen is assembled and installed and the bathroom tile is laid. Now the plumbers can come back and install the finished plumbing items like the sinks, toilet, shower, faucets, and hot water heater. And then the electrician can come back and add outlets and wire the water heater and this thing called a grinder pump which is required by the city to handle sewage. And everything is done. Almost. Greenpot and I make a final punch list of items that need to be worked on later like trim, window sills, porches, and a few holes in the wall. But the construction is basically finished, and that allows me to get a temporary occupancy permit from the city, and I can move in. As you can see, my interior design will be an ongoing work in progress. I won't settle on things like that and landscaping for months or even years to come. But one thing I know for sure, it took a lot of hard work, but I got exactly the house I wanted.